Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to have you back. So good to see each and every one of you. And thank you for joining us online, for joining us here on YouTube. We are finishing up the seven woes of the Pharisees together. And we've arrived at the last one. We are at woe number seven. Jesus is having a meal with some Pharisees. And instead of it being a nice social engagement or uh, getting to know you occasion, Jesus uses this as a platform to tell these guys everything that he doesn't like about them. But who were they? Right? We, we really haven't talked about that. Who, who are the Pharisees? Because I think when Christians hear this word, in our mind, it just means the bad guys, right? The people that Jesus didn't like. And he was always speaking out against them. Well, the Pharisees were actually a very influential group within Judaism, and especially at the time of Jesus and the early church. They were known for their emphasis on personal goodness. And in fact, they were, they were uh, people that kind of felt separated, distant from everybody else. They were a clique. They were their own little group. In fact, even their name, Pharisee, that's what it means. It means separated, okay? But again, who are they? Because it's not really a simple answer because there aren't any Jewish groups that existed back then that called themselves the Pharisees. The, the label came from people on the outside. People watching them called them the separated ones. And there aren't that many texts that describe them. Modern scholars believe the Pharisees were maybe not as influential or even as large a group as people might think. Uh, Josephus was a first century Jewish and Roman historian, even in all of his writings where he talks about the early church and Jesus, he, uh, the, G Josephus only mentions the Pharisees about 20 times. The Pharisees were probably middle-class businessmen. They were leaders in their community, leaders in their synagogue. We know that they were also part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling class. And as far as what they believed, well, uh, of course they accepted the Word of God, which would be what we would say was the Old Testament. But they also felt that the oral tradition right? Those traditions that were passed down uh, from, from Moses, really, would have been just as important, just as equal. So they upheld oral tradition alongside the scriptures as equal. And like I said, modern Christians, we tend to see the Pharisees as the bad guys uh, of the Bible. And it's mostly because of these judgments the accusations that we hear from Jesus, calling them legalistic, calling them hypocritical. But it's actually thanks to the Pharisees that we now have access to the original Hebrew Bible. Did you know that? The original texts uh, that relied heavily on oral tradition to correctly and identify and pronounce ancient words, it was their strict uh, detail to that that allowed us to make proper translations for the Dead Sea Scrolls. So at least in part, Christians can thank the Pharisees for ensuring that the Old Testament was so carefully preserved. Plus, the Pharisees also helped Judaism prepare for life after the Romans destroyed Herod's temple. They helped the Jews apply and obey the laws of Moses in their early life. So perhaps it's better to think of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes, the experts at the law, maybe not as the bad guys, but it's like when Jesus came onto the scene, Israel needed a heart transplant. And these groups were like an overactive immune system and they were rejecting the very thing that they needed to survive. And the seven woes that Jesus gives, well, they're like his doctor checkup. Last one, Matthew 23, verses 29 through 32. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets 
and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus, you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murder the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your fathers. I think this is one of those passages where you read it and take a quick first pass at it and you think, I need to go back and look at that again and really see what Jesus is saying here because I think it's obvious, right? This, this has some layers to it. Jesus starts his accusation by saying, for you build the tombs of the prophets. And that should lead us to ask, who are the prophets? Well, that would be the Old Testament, right? The men and women who were the founding parents, the old schoolers of the Bible. And, and the Pharisees loved the Old Testament heroes, right? They loved the prophets. So I thought, you know what, let's look at one. Let's look at one prophet and paint a picture of what Jesus is talking about. We'll use Jeremiah. Jeremiah is also called the weeping prophet. He's one of the major prophets of the Hebrew Bible. According to Jewish tradition, Jeremiah wrote the book of Jeremiah. He wrote the book of Kings and the book of Lamentations. So the Pharisees would have been huge fans of Jeremiah. They would have had his t-shirt. They would have had his rookie card. They would know all his stats, right? Jeremiah says in chapter 20, if I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name. There is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones and I am weary with holding it in and I cannot. What's Jeremiah talking about? He's talking about his job. He's talking about what he does for a living. He's describing his role as a prophet. And he says, I get this message from God and it's like a burning fire. He says, I can't hold it in. I, I can't keep these words in me. I can't, I can't just go through the motions and be myself. I can't push it down. I can't fake it. I have to get the message out of me. He says, when I get a message from God, it's like heartburn. <laughs> and I have to tell people what it is. I can't keep it in. This is what it's like to be a prophet. A prophet is not complacent. A prophet is not lazy. Who do prophets tell? They tell the Jews, right? It's a message from God, so it's to God's people. They don't, they don't talk to non-believers. They don't talk to non-Jews. The message from God needs to go to God's people. So that should make us ask, well, then what was their message typically about? I mean, what did the prophets say? Well, let's look at that too. Jeremiah 7, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice, one with another. If you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. What is the message of Jeremiah? What is the message of the prophets? Amend your ways, right? Change. You need to change. The prophet's message is reform. God says, stand at the gates. In other words, go to the most prominent place where everyone is going to see you and then shout. If you're going into the temple for worship, know this, you need to change. And what does God say is supposed to be the focus? Justice, fair treatment for the immigrant and the widow and the orphan. What else? Stop worshiping at other temples, right? He says, there's no other gods. The prophet stands at the door of the church and says, yes, the sign outside says the temple of the Lord, but that doesn't save you. If you are gonna go inside and you are gonna be God's people, then you need to change your ways. 
unless you start caring about the immigrant who lives among you, the widows and the orphans, the people who are in jail falsely, God says, you need to care about the things that I care about. A prophet is not complacent. The prophet's message is reform. One more, Jeremiah 22. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him his wages, who says, I will build myself a great house with spacious upper rooms, who cuts out windows for it, paneling it with cedar and painting it with vermilion. What is this all about? Jeremiah says, woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice? Well, who can afford to build a house with a second floor? Who builds their homes by oppression? The rich. Jeremiah says, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him wages? Who can afford servants? Who has the power to make people work for them? Jeremiah says, I will build myself a great house with spacious upper rooms, a house made from a cedar painted vermilion, painted red. Who has that kind of money? Who does the prophet speak to? People of power, right? The prophets address people of power, the rich, the wealthy, the influence. The prophets didn't mind taking their message to the king or the president or the priests. They, they were not intimidated by the highest office. Why not? Because that's not their words. The prophet's message is the word of God, right? They are bringing a message from God. They're, they're, this is the fire that's burning in their belly that they have to get out. Jeremiah says, you build your house on the backs of slaves. It's not a, he's not embarrassed. He's not ashamed to bring this message. Prophets were not complacent. They spoke about reform and they spoke to the people with the most power. They were the original rebels. They mixed things up. So how did the people receive the word? How did the people receive the word of the prophet? That's a good question. And it's a crucial question to understanding what Jesus is saying in our passage today. Jeremiah 26, 11, Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man, Jeremiah, deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against the city as you have heard with your own ears. So how was Jeremiah's message received? Uh, not good, right? Not good. They say he speaks against the city and the king, so the people say, kill the prophet, <laughs> right? Kill the prophet. The prophet, he's fighting for the cause of the underprivileged. He's speaking against leadership. He's speaking against the institution. And the people say, don't rock the boat. We like things the way they are. Don't tell us to change. Don't tell us how to worship. Don't tell us how to live. And instead of changing and listening to God, the people say, shoot the messenger, kill the prophet. And this is where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. He says, for you build the tombs of the prophets, you decorate the monuments of the righteous. In other words, you love these guys. You love the prophets. You decorate their graves. And they say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. In other words, the Pharisees said, if we had lived back then, we wouldn't have done it like that. We would have listened to Jeremiah. The Pharisees believed our ancestors were dumb. They were ignorant. They would have listened to the prophets, they say. They say, if we had lived back then, we wouldn't have made that mistake. In fact, if Jeremiah were alive today, we'd recognize him. We'd listen to him. And Jesus says, really? Really? <laughs> really? Okay, okay. Challenge accepted. The message of the prophets was to care for the marginalized. What was Jesus' message? The prophets were not complacent. They couldn't sit still. They couldn't keep their message inside. What about Jesus? John 5, 
the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered him, my father is working until now and I am working. Jesus can't sit still, can he? He's always teaching. Even in our passage with the seven woes, he's invited to dinner to sit and eat and make casual chit chat. And Jesus uses this moment to teach and to preach. The prophet spoke about reform, demanded people take care of the infirm and the fringe society. Did Jesus? Mark 2, as he reclined at a table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Jesus said in Luke 14, and when you feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. The prophets said, amend your way. What does Jesus say? Matthew 4, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 5, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Matthew 12, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, another prophet, and behold, something greater than Jonah <coughs> is here. Luke 13, unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Repent is the Greek word meta noeo, meta noeo, the first part, meta. Meta is a prefix that means movement, it means change, right? Noeo is this um, part of your inner self, and it would be maybe best described for us today as it's your default setting, right? It's, it's how you view reality. It's your normalness. Repent means you need a new default. Your default setting is broken. Jesus' message was to change your disposition towards life, towards reality, to have a transformed setting. And he says, change it. Change it to what's really important. That sounds a lot like the message of the prophets. The prophets spoke to people of power. Did Jesus? <laughs> yeah. I and mean, that's why we're studying the seven woes right now. Right now in our study, Jesus is confronting all the people of religious power. There were more than 70 verses in the Bible where Jesus confronts and talks to some sort of religious leaders in the Bible. Jesus spoke to powerful people all the time. And in his last woe, Jesus says to them, you say that you love the prophets and if, and if they were alive today, you think you would listen to them and that you wouldn't try to kill them, just like your ancestors did. John 11, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and who had seen what Jesus had done believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs, and if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And when the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation, then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Jesus heals a man in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him. How to destroy him. Do you smell that? That's irony. Jesus says to them, you decorate Jeremiah's tomb and you say, we'd never kill the prophet. We'd have been good. But you, but you guys, you guys are the same ones trying to kill me. So you guess you really are, Jesus says, I guess you really are the children of your fathers. History is doomed to repeat itself. Jesus says, you guys claim to you, you claim to you wise and learned Bible scholars, and yet you haven't learned anything. Did you know the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee? 
It's true, he was a Pharisee. In, in fact, he was tried by the Sanhedrin, by the Jewish ruling council, and at that trial, he tells them. Acts 23, verse 6 says, Now when pa Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to this hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. But Paul's no longer a Pharisee at this moment. He feels his life has been transformed. Paul has been born again. Paul was awakened. Like we talked about last week when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. I used to be one way. I encountered Jesus, and then I came out differently on the other side. So Paul is different now. How different? Well, when his Pharisees, brothers, are busy washing their hands, and they're tithing out their spice rack, trying to be holy, trying to be set apart, and trying to be as saved as possible. And while they're enjoying all their titleship and their fancy robes and their positions at the heads of tables, Paul writes, though formally, speaking of when he was a Pharisee, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul, Paul, Paul who wrote 13 books of the Bible says, out of all the sinners ever, I am the worst. Paul who is quoted probably more times in pastor's sermons than Jesus himself, says, I acted ignorantly. The Pharisees say, we love the prophets. If we had lived back then, we would have listened. We would have obeyed. And Jesus says, Dah, let, let's not be so quick to judge. Okay? Let's not be so quick to think, well, you know, I live in 2020 and I'm woke. It, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't have made the same mistakes back then if it were us. In Matthew 7, at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite? Ah, who are the hypocrites? Who are the hypocrites? Who would offer to remove sin or to correct sin in somebody else's life? Jesus is probably staring at the Pharisees right when he says this. He says, first, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Take the log out of my own eye? Why? Because, like the Apostle Paul admits, we all need grace. We all need grace. Paul says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but, he says, but I received mercy. Ephesians 4 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. What does that mean for us? Well, let's think about the illustration that Jesus gives us. Let's say you're on a construction site and you accidentally got a big piece of wood stuck in your eye. But instead of doing something about your problem, you ignore it and then you go and tell your coworker that he's a tiny speck of sawdust in his eye. Now, we would think that's foolish behavior, right? What you need to do is you need to take care of your big problem, that chunk of wood that's in your eye, before you go and correct your brother or sister's little problem. But this is usually what we do when we criticize someone else, when we judge someone else. We look at some little matter in another person's life and we criticize them all the while ignoring that we have just as much sin in our own life. Over and over, we see faults in others because we don't want to believe anything better about them. And so often we think we have a first-hand view of other people's shortcomings, when in fact, our own view is distorted by our issues, our darkness, our drama. Look, before we get too concerned about correcting others, 
especially people who lived in the past. We need to correct ourselves. James 1 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In this society, we always tend to judge by the way people look, how they dress, what they look like, how they talk, if they're like us, if they're different, or if we feel uncomfortable about, around them, and then we'll try to fix them so they can become more like us. If they are not like us, then we feel uncomfortable around them. We judge them by what they look like or who they are. Our natural human instinct is to judge people. Just like the Pharisees judged their forefathers of the past. For some reason, everyone, no matter what walk of life or how old they are, they just like to judge people, like to judge their character, how they act, if they're not up to our standards. And we look down on them, and then we make sure to gossip about them, and then we exclude them from our groups. We form our little cliques. And Christians are some of the best at doing this. Jesus is mad at the Pharisees because they were the best at doing this. It was even in their name, the Pharisees, the separated ones, the special ones, the clique. Jesus yells at them during a meal, and he says, you guys should be different. And so should we. As Christians, we are called to be different. We're not supposed to act like everyone else. We're not supposed to follow the crowd. Jesus says, repent, change your default setting. God wants us to be different and, and to show everyone else what it means to love, no matter how they dress, how they act, who they vote for, or any horror or wrong that they did in their past. Galatians 6, 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. This last woe of Jesus, this is his drop the mic. It's basically him saying, you think you're better than everybody else. And you even think you're better than people who lived in the past. You think you would have done it differently. You think you would have done it better. Humility. Humility puts God first. And when we do that, then we do his will. Paul says, out of all the sinners, I'm the worst. Humility. Jesus put God first. He taught, suffered, and died so that we could be saved. Service to others is rewarding, and it happens when we put God first. D.L. Moody said the measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. We all have something to offer our neighbor. We all have something to offer the world. Let us strive to humble ourselves more, to serve others more than we judge them. And true, we cannot serve everyone, but we can serve someone. And if everybody is serving somebody, then everyone will be served. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these words of Jesus. We thank you that they are available, that they are on a page in a book that is so easily accessible to us. May we be hungry and thirsty for these pages, for these words. May the words of Jesus excite us. May they challenge us. May we accept them as truth. And may we take them out into the streets and tell and proclaim and shout. May we stand at the city gates with the message of God. May it be a fire that burns in our bellies that we have to get out to tell the world what Jesus said. Repent, change, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Lord, we pray that every knee bows. We pray that every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. And as we go from this place, 
May we continue to be your children, your servants, your disciples, your teachers, your prophets, your priests. May we continue to be the hand of God. May we be the church. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Thanks for spending some time with me. Don't forget, this is a YouTube link. You can just clip and copy the address, the URL at the top. You can put it and post it on your own Facebook wall, or you can send it in an email and share it with a friend or family member that you think might need to hear this message today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.